Hi guys, welcome to this little webinar to whatever it is, night or day when you're watching it. Um, I'm Peter Pakula and we're with Bill Pino, who's actually the boss of Squid Nation, uh, a product which we bring into Australia and sell incredibly successfully. Uh, Bill is not just a tackle manufacturer, he's also a world-class fisherman, been in lots of winning, winning boats, which we'll talk about later. So Bill, let's hear it about your products. Hey Peter, thanks for having me and uh, what's up guys? It's uh, been a while since I've been to Australia. I can't wait to get back there and uh, give it a shot. Um, we're going we're gonna to talk about uh, some of the products that, that we, um, we work with Peter on and uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is probably the one that I'm most passionate about and that's our, that's our dredge bars and the uh, proper use of what bar to use when you're pulling what products, uh, because th there is a difference and, and uh, you'll get a lot longer life out of the bar if you use the proper product and uh, you'll get a lot better performance on a bar uh, if you use uh, that pro proper product. Here, squid dredges have become very, very, very popular, okay? Now, we're using electric reels to, to, to bring them in and to deploy them. We're using, we're using uh, um, booms, we're using outriggers and all sorts of stuff to, to deploy our dredges and then LPs to bring them in or, or, or hook our electric to bring them in. And so there's a lot of power behind it. So we use heavy bars. We use heavy stuff, okay? So when you're looking at something like our new, our new, uh, Pakula series limo green dredge. You're talking about 39 squids, and all 39 squids have a one ounce egg sinker in front of it. You got a heavy duty bar, which is a 36 inch bar, and then you got a six or an eight or a 10 pound dredge weight in front of it. Okay, that's a lot of pull that you got going on there. Um, but mostly, I want to talk about the bar. If you notice this bar, it has a heavy bend to it, okay? That heavy bend is very, very important when it's just sitting here. Uh, and it's very important when it's, when it's being trolled behind a boat, okay? The one thing that kills bars is vibration. So if you're trolling something and the bars doesn't have a bit of a bend to it, uh, that means that there's not a lot of pressure on it, so that bar can vibrate back and forth uh, with, the, with, with the way it's being pulled, with the way it's falling off a wave, with the way you're turning, uh, with vibration coming off of your uh, boat wash. Everything can affect the vibration on that bar. As that bar vibrates, think about you Wahoo fishermen or you guys who use wire. How do you break wire? Okay, you bend it back and forth and it breaks in the exact spot where you want it to break. Okay, well, if you're using light stuff on a heavy bar, you don't have this pull. And when you don't have this pull, you have a bar that starts vibrating back and forth and it breaks. All right, so what we did was we have a lot of new products because there are a lot of, the, the dredge fishing is really coming into its age with guys with, uh, with uh, 25 foot boats, 30 foot boats, 18 foot boats, you know, whatever, they, whatever, everybody wants to get into dredge fishing, but we can't pull all this heavy stuff on a 25 foot boat uh, that doesn't have LPs, that, you know, that may be using uh, uh, downriggers or that may be using hand or maybe using an 80, an old 80 or something. Um, so we had to lighten it up, okay? One of the things that's, that we use that's light is a strip dredge, which you guys are very, very familiar with in Australia. Okay, this is our red strip dredge. We use the Pakula strip dredge, the clear strip dredge. We use a blue strip dredge and a pink strip, strip dredge. That slimy, that strip dredge with the slimy fish on it, it's that's a killer. just stupid. It's that, a killer. that should be unfair. 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, I had this one ready, so I used this one, okay? Now, the gauge on this bar is much lighter, all right? But so is what we're pulling. It's much lighter. This thing weighs about, I don't know, three pounds. But look at the bend. The bend on the bar is about the same as it is up there. Okay, why? Because we got a much lighter gauge bar and we have a much lighter uh, 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 product that we're pulling behind it. So what happens when this gets pulled? You get a bend. When you get a bend, you don't get vibration. So this light wire bar is gonna be used at the proper speeds. You know, most guys fish dredges anywhere between five and a half knots up to probably a maximum of nine knots, maybe eight and a half knots, eight and a half knots, nine knots. Um, some, some, you know, like that bar, I would be confident trolling that one at nine and a half if it's got a good heavy load. But that that's what we do to alleviate any breakage. Don't put this on that. Okay. I wish I'd known um, that before, huh? In a smaller <laughs> bar. What's that? I wish I knew that before. <laughs> in a small, well, you use a lot of smaller bars. Yeah. Okay. You use a lot of 12 inch bars. Yeah. And you use a lot of 24 inch bars. Yeah. Okay. The further, the further the distance from the tip of the bar to the center of the hub, the greater the vibration will be on the bar. Yeah. So when you use a small ball like a 24 inch bar, you don't need to have that bend because you've reduced, you've reduced the vibration by almost half or almost uh, two, a third on a 24 inch bar. Yeah. Okay. Because you're, you're, you're using a much, there's, there's a much greater, there's a much shorter distance to the center of the bar. So therefore, there's less material to vibrate as you get beyond uh, a, an acceptable place. And the 12-inch bar, there's no vibration. It doesn't matter. Okay, that's that, that's a popular bar down there too. Our Australian boat trade sells very well. So there's two ways to combat uh, breakages on bars. Go smaller, and I'll talk to you about that. And 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 hopefully we we agree on this. Um, maybe we don't. I don't know. But um, go smaller on your bar, go smaller on your presentation, uh, or use a lighter gauge. I'm gonna put this down right here. Something that's becoming very, very popular for probably the, as of maybe a year and a half ago, before that, the last six years, everybody wanted a bigger dredge, yeah. more stuff. I want, I want, and, and, and we're guilty of, 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 um, of, um, of advertising that because we were selling bigger dredges, the bigger the dredge and big dredges are great. They have a great profile. Most bait balls are big. Uh, so you want a great big old presentation behind your boat. It's my belief anyway, that the boat raises the fish. The lures, the dredges, the teasers keep the fish in the spread. Your biggest teaser is your biggest uh, propagator of whitewash, which is your boat. If a, if a fish is down, you know, if you mark a fish at 20 fathoms, you know, it doesn't look up and say, you know, there's a medium sprocket and hot frigate, okay? It, it looks up and it reacts to a whole bunch of frothy crap in the water. That to him ignites something in their little pea brain and says, there's bait up there, I'm gonna go eat it. When they get up in the spread, it's my belief, I'm not a fish, I can't tell you if it's truth or not. I believe when they get up in the spread, what you have in your spread agitates their senses to a point that it causes a reaction bite. Okay, uh, whether it be uh, the, the the lumo additives in the lure skirts that they can see better than, than than we can, whether it be a bait ball in a dredge, 
uh, whether it be the erratic, uh, uh, the erratic action of a flippy floppy. Something is agitating them into striking. And that's what gets us, that, that, that's where we come in and say, this is what works for us. Okay, I can't say it's gonna work for you, this is what works for us. And, um, and, and, I'll, and I'll give you a very good example of that. Um, and I don't wanna get too far off the topic of dredges. I'll give you a very good example of that. In Cabo, a couple months ago, I think I told you this, Peter. In Cabo, a couple months ago, we were using two dredges. One was a mud flap dredge, one with a squid dredge. We were using a flippy floppy on one side, and we were using a single medium sprocket or a mouse 3D It's lining, okay? This had nothing on it. It had nothing in front of it. It had nothing behind it. It was just this, okay? And we, we're, we're in Mag Bay, so you're, all, you're gonna get bit all over the place. But on the flippy floppy side, we were getting bit. On the right dredge, we were getting bit pretty, we were, we were seeing fish come to the right dredge. This thing was all by itself. You cannot tell me that this thing raised the fish better than the boat that we were trolling on. Okay, I don't believe that. But what I believe is when it got into the spread, this 3D fish print that we were using on a boat called the Downtime was absolutely dead. And I would say on at least two of the three days, uh, you were seeing a 60% to here and a 40% to the rest of the spread. Yeah. That was a, that, that was a phenomenal thing. And I've been, the, 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 the fish prints have been a little bit, a, a little bit delayed in, in getting popular here. And I just don't understand why. Um, it, it, when that fish gets in the spread, there's something about it. Maybe it's the luma white squirt. Maybe it's the slimy print. Maybe it's the head. Maybe it's the lightness of the of the of the three D printed head. Who, who the hell knows? I'm not a fish, but I do know that in Cabo, uh, this is our third trip to Cabo already, and out of three trips, uh, and I was with a lure manufacturer from a competing lure on another boat uh, it, last year, the year before last, and he just shook his head. He literally just shook his head. When he saw the action that this thing had, and and, and the the action it had, I mean by Strike Marlin behind it, so I think the boat raised the fish, and I think what you have in your spread uh, caused the reaction to get bit. All right. So look, I I thank you for that, and yet yeah, the the response to the fish prints um, online has been absolutely. In fact, ninety percent of the stuff I sell online is is fish prints, and yeah, even in Australia, you know. They're not tourist trinkets. They don't have fancy heads. They don't have the power in them. They've just got the ultimate design that you can't do any other way at the moment except on a 3D printer. And it's just, you know, the results of the people who buy them are incredible. Even this morning I've had, you know, it's a Saturday. I've had three phone calls to guys who have been busted off on fish prints the first time they use them. And they're going, you know, we're not used to this stuff. And I go, I know, I know. And they think I'm going to get upset. I say, well, that's why, you know, I make lures to catch fish or bust off and, I win. <laughs> you got to work out how to catch them. All right, Bill, but I, I totally agree with you. But say, for example, you were just trolling the fish print, nothing else. Do you for a second think you'd raise as many fish without all the other no. teasers? I totally agree no. with you. I think you need teasers. You know, in Australia, we're selling a lot of dredges. We're selling a lot of, you know, witch doctors, which are way too expensive to export much of. Um, and I would not fish without teasers. Simply would not do it because, you know, I'm, I'm Australia, we're normally fishing in little boats, you know, 15 foot to 22 foot is the average size boat that's out there now. Sure, we've got the big game boats, the cans boats and all that sort of stuff. But to compete with them and get the shots without teasers, you're kidding yourself. Okay. Like even when, you, you know, you're fishing for big money tournaments and we've got people in Australia say, look, you only need three lures out the back of the boat. You don't need teasers. You're fishing the biggest tournaments in the world and you're winning them and you're on the podium all the time. We'll talk about that later. 
But would you ever fish a million dollar tournament with just three lures in the water off any boat? Absolutely, absolutely not. Yeah, a absolutely not. And, yeah, and, and it's been proven over and over and over again, especially in the early days when 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 boats weren't really adapting to te uh, to dredges in Costa Rica, let's say. Yeah. Um, the guys that came in there with dredges pretty much walked away with it. Oh, and slowly you watch the, the, the migration of boats go into dredges. Yeah. You know, because those guys, they would pull four lures. You know, they, they, would, they would pull like the medium sprockets in the back and the rats in the front uh, and, and lures like that. And, and, and that, was their, that was their teasers. Yeah, that, that that's, their teasers. That's pretty, that, that's pretty oh. typical of areas with lots of fish. They don't have to try too hard to catch a satisfactory amount for their clients. <laughs> yeah, but when you're you're talking about a tournament yeah. in that situation, we were uh, the guys with the dredges uh, learned how to absolutely uh, crush it. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, and then and then they quickly learned that you didn't need a ballyhoo dredge or a mullet dredge. You could get away with a with a brightly a bright colored uh, uh, a bright colored uh, artificial dredge and that pretty much to me solidified a lot of things uh, it, it's it, it's the the uh, the fact that we can agitate a fish into biting absolutely um, well I don't know what I'm supposed to disagree but, with I haven't disagreed with anything you've said the craziest thing I've ever seen we went to the Bahamas to fish a tournament off our Guana Cay and uh, all the big boats, of course, yes. all 60 footers and stuff come in and they're more up at the wharf and immediately somebody gets out, he's got a folding table and a chair and he's got 10 Yeti full of mullet. And some guy starts rigging mullets yes. to put on dredges and they're doing it 24 hours a day and they've got, what, 60 mullet on a dredge, something like that, some insane amount of fish. Yeah. And they only last an hour and swap yes. them out. So that's what they used to do. Yeah. But even, yeah. even before yeah. that, you know, when, when dredges started, you know, part of the history of the, the dredges, and I think it started in Florida, uh, was the dredges weren't towed in the beginning. They were actually used drifting when, when using live bait and, and kites and stuff, weren't they, to attract the fish closer to the boat and have a bit of sparkle and action under the boat like a school of squid or even the sparkle, the early strip teasers. I remember in the boat shows in Miami, you know, back in the early 80s, and, you know, it wasn't for quite a while that they started trolling them. No, yeah, I think I, I I I think they actually did. I think that was the uh, the next generation was when we started seeing the strip teasers that were just being dropped in the water on the short riggers, and they kind of would bounce up and down while they were kite fishing or something like that, and they would use that. Yeah. But no, the the, the original the, the the original guys. Um, um, and, and I'm sorry, they're legends, but uh, I, I can't. Um, Nick Smith owns a boat called Old Reliable, and his uh, Old Reliable and his captain, uh, which everybody will know. Um, he was one of the original guys that used it, and there was a couple other guys that I, I'm not. I'm not a Florida guy, so I don't know. But uh, they were using. Get this, they were using in the beginning small dredges with uh, you know six or six or seven uh, mullets. Yeah. Uh, that they were pulling. The, the original original guys, I, I think, were using old rockfish umbrella rigs. Yeah. So they were real tiny dredges. They were real tiny dredges. I even heard that they got so uh, they got so proficient at using dredges that I don't know if this is true or not, but but I did hear this that that they would prefer to cut their dredge off than to have a competitor see the dredge in the very very beginning. Yes, Fred Archer. Um, I, I had a lot to do with Fred Archer early on when he was doing the. Uh, the uh, spreader bars, which we'll talk about later, but yeah, he, he was saying that too. And I've got to admit, yeah. when we were so, developing, uh, I, I think I used to cut off which doc. I used to cut off which doctors when other boats got too close. <laughs> when um, when these guys started, I, I don't think the dredge. I don't think somebody started with a triple tier, uh, you know, sixty mile dredge. Oh, sure. Uh, they started sure. with a single. They started with a single tier with a twenty-four ounce, a twenty-four inch bar, probably, and they had and they had big old mullets, fresh mullets that they had caught, and uh, and and they started seeing fish come to that. Okay? Yeah. Um, you know, 
fast forward to one of the trends that I'm starting to see, especially because the smaller boat is getting uh, very, very, very popular uh, here in, in the States. You know, that, that 26, uh, it's, it's crazy to say a 40 footer is a small boat, but around here, a 40 footer is a small boat now. Yeah. Um, center console go fast boats, okay? Um, and even some of the big boys, some of the world class uh, tournament fishing boats, I've noticed have started moving to a smaller, more compact dredge. Yeah. Okay. Uh, very, very similar to the original mullet dredge. Okay. But a little bit bigger than that. But, you know, 29 inches, uh, something that's very easily manageable. Uh, for this, when I ask him this, they tell me the exact same thing that I just relayed to you. When I ask him, why did you go to a smaller dredge? What's up with the 36 inch dredge? And they said, the boat raises the fish. Yeah. Once the fish get in the spread, they're looking for a bait ball. They're looking for a compact bait ball that they're used to seeing. That triggers a reaction to them. Yeah. Uh, so we're starting to see 29 inch dredges get very, very, very popular. When, you know, a couple a couple of years ago, people were asking me, how can I make a 60 inch dredge? Can I make a dredge that'll hold six dredges? And I was like, geez, guys, I mean, what are we going to be pulling this with? Other boats? Are we all going to have like three boss, two Boston whalers on each side pulling your dredges? Yeah. But um, so so that's what I'm starting to see. Um, smaller dredges, more compact dredges. Um, and it seems to be working very, very well. Okay. Thank you for that. Now, what's the scenario? Okay. You've got a dredge out there and you're baiting and switching or your, your lure trolling, or you're trolling a bait. How close does a bait, or whatever the presentation with a hook in it, have to be behind the dredge for it to be the most effective? Um, hold on a second, I got something going on here. Let me just cancel this, all right. Um, the spread that we use when we're marlin fishing uh, has two dredges, that on a pulley system, we have about, you know, anywhere from 125 to 210 feet back. 210 feet of line on the counter. Yeah. Okay. So you divide that by 50% to get how far behind the boat it is. So it's anywhere from 60 to 110 feet yeah. behind the boat. Anywhere from 50 to 110 feet behind the boat. Okay. From there, we have, uh, we, we have teasers that depending on the size of the size of the boat, we have teasers that are usually set uh, about a weight behind it and outside. Yeah. About a weight behind it and outside. We have two long riggers. Our two long riggers are naked ballyhoo. And those naked ballyhoo are set um, probably back about 20 yards behind the four teasers that we use. Yeah. Then we have two flat lines. And the flat lines, there's a, there's, a, there's a train of thought here on the flat lines. Do you want to tease that fish off the teaser as you're bringing in the teaser and you're dropping back that flat line? Therefore, the bait has to be a little bit in front of the flat line. Okay, so it's basically sitting somewhere just behind the dredge, but just in front of the teaser. Yeah. And then there's the, the one of the things that's gotten very, very popular and in, in almost almost mandatory in sailfish in these white marlin tournaments is anglers are holding their rods for eight hours a day. Yeah. Okay. I know you like a hammock on the boat. I, yeah. I know you told me. You bet. Uh, we hold the rod, <laughs> we hold the rods for we hold the rods for eight hours a day. Th therefore, supposedly we're gonna be more alert and more ready for when that fish comes. That's true when there's, you know, 30 bites a day. Yeah. When there's two bites a day, we drift away, okay? Just like every other human being. But if you're holding the rod, then you can put that ballyhoo in the danger zone, yeah. which is just behind the teaser, okay? Uh, because the idea is you're going to be ready if that thing uh, decides to crash the bait, which it does a little bit more often if your bait is there, 
or you know you can you can kind of bring it up very quickly to your to your teaser to try and pitch them off the teaser or try and hook them off the teaser. Okay. But but everything is um, you know it, it, it's how confident you are and I don't even know if confidence is the right word. It's how confident you are in your spread in that uh, you know you have trial and errored on your boat on a smaller boat. You know, I see stuff much closer in. Yeah. On the boat, on the boat we fish on, which is sixty-four feet, uh, I see stuff quite a bit further back, quite a bit further spread out. Yeah. Trying to make that spread a little bit bigger. Um, I see people with outboard boats try to put their stuff a little bit further back to get it out of that that wash that, that that's a little bit more prevalent on an outboard boat. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, I've seen fish eat, eat the stern off of an outboard. So, you know, it's, it's, again, I, I think that, I, I think what your presentation does dictates a lot of what you're doing. All right. When, when uh, you I'll give you a real quick. Yeah, go on. Go yeah, give me the quick. Yeah, go on. You go first. I'll give you a real quick story. I was, we, we were fishing with uh, a buddy of mine on the fish whistle and we were big eye tuna fishing. And I said, do you mind if I put out a dredge or if I put out a flippy floppy? And he said, no, you can do anything you want uh, on the inside there, but do not touch my Squid Nation Big Heavies and Joe Shoots and whatever he was using on the longs. Yeah. Those are mine. The captain was up on the bridge. He goes, those are mine. All right. So I said, I'll tell you what, we'll just start with your spread. It's your boat. You're way more successful than I am at big eye fishing. Let's do that. Yeah. So we put it, we put it on there and it was pretty amazing. Actually, I had an Australian guy on the boat. Um, I can't remember it. Matt uh, was on the boat with us and he saw this happen. The, the fish, the big eyes started hitting the long riggers. Okay. Those Joe shoots and those Squid Nation big heavies that were out there. And he put, he put two on the long riggers and three across the back, just straight off the tip. Way the hell back there. Way yeah. the hell back there. And we started catching singles of big eyes, which is very exciting. I mean, it was 160, 180, 200 pound fish. So we knew that there was fish there. We knew we were getting bit there. Um, he said, put out your stuff now. We had two fish in the boat. We put out two dredges. And we put out two flippy floppies. We put out one dredge and we put out two flippy floppies. And the next bite was a wolf pack right off the stern of the boat. They went <laughs> absolutely ballistic. They must have swam right by the damn long riggers. Because yeah. they just came right into the flat lines and just destroyed us. It was an unbelievable scene. And we caught um, we caught nine big eyes. It was an overnight trip. We caught nine big eyes in an hour and a half and we were headed home by 7.30 in the evening because we could, we didn't have any more room for fish. Wow. Yeah. So those teasers, in my opinion, helped bring that bite closer to the boat. Yeah, look, you know, we sort of get this this thing where, you know, I've been fishing here for 30 years and, you know, this is what we do, this is the best way of doing it. But, you know, guys like you and me, you know, we get reports from all over the world almost daily. Right? And, and pretty much every day we get a report or some sort of information. Yet you'll get this guy, these guys who live 100 miles away from each other saying, well, what works up there doesn't work down here. <laughs> and it drives you nuts. You know, we're, I live in Queensland and we've got guys in New South Wales that say, yeah, well, that's what you Queenslanders catch fish on. That doesn't work down here. Have you found any difference with the way you fish, whether you're in Morocco, the Bahamas, the Galapagos or anywhere else? I find that everything works exactly the same absolutely everywhere. There's almost no difference in the systems. We uh, we we kind of pride ourselves in that. We we yeah, you guys somewhere and just kill them. Fix, yeah, <laughs> we try to fix the same way. Yeah, everywhere we go. Yeah, and you know when I was talking to one of the most uh, one of the most successful tournament boats uh, that that's ever been uh, and still is the Bill Fisher. Uh, I, I talked to uh, Johnny and I said, um, what are you guys doing different in Costa Rica uh, from Ocean City? Yeah. And he said, absolutely nothing. Yeah. 
absolutely nothing. He said, he said we, we, we have a meat dredge on one side and we have a squid dredge on the other side, a red squid dredge on the other side. And everybody uses medium ballyhoos in, uh, in, in Costa Rica. Uh, he's like, we use the same small ballyhoos that we do uh, anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, and and those guys those guys win wherever they go. Absolutely. Wherever they go. Yeah. You know? I can't reckon that's pretty much it for dredges. Thanks, Bill. Angling, ang yeah, angling techniques I've seen change, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, um, you don't have to go there. Techniques change, you don't have but, to go um, there. Not, <laughs> we'll, we'll let that, we'll, we'll leave that to the professional anglers to discuss. Yeah. So. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for talking about so, dredges. That pretty much covers it, I think. So when you move beyond the dredge, we go to the teasers. All right. I talked a little bit about the teasers in that in that instance in Cabo where we use that 3D fish print on one side and we use a chain on the other side. And there it was just absolutely incredible, uh, the reaction that we were getting from the striped marlin. Um, one of our very, very best tuna, we, we, we put a hook in everything when we're tuna fishing. Uh, and when we're marlin fishing, uh, we, we try not to put a hook in anything. I know you and I argue about that all the time. Uh, we, <laughs> we try to just keep all the teasers out there and, um, and, and put a hook in our baits. To, uh, come to on, Bill. Them. The only time you followed the instructions, what was your result? Come on. <laughs> come on. So, come on. Eat, eat some so, pie. <laughs> So for for, uh, for blue marlin and and for uh, for tuna fish, uh, the original flippy floppy has just been absolutely phenomenal. Even for the Pacific sales, uh, even for white marlin, they've been absolutely phenomenal. This is the original flippy floppy, which is four four flippy floppies in a chain. Uh, followed by a bird, and then we use a very heavy-duty swivel because we don't know if you're tuna fishing or if you're marlin fishing. So if you're tuna fishing, you can put a hook bait back here. We don't like to put a hook bait more than four feet back, usually about three and a half to four feet back. The reason being is uh, being ambitious. Uh, when you're leadering a fish, uh, you don't want to have to leader six feet after you get through all this crap, okay? Yeah. So, so we, we just say three feet, three and a half to four feet tops is uh, where we would put it. This is one of my favorite hook baits for tuna fish, okay? I use the, uh, the, the mini sprocket and Brad J, um, and we just use uh, like, like a 25, a 25 uh, extra strong hook or a southern style tuna hook, one or the other, and um, three feet behind this, and it's money. It's absolutely money. Um, big fish, little fish, uh, you know, they, they, they all like, they, they, I think you might even said this to me once, they, they, you know, we, we go out there with eight or nine inch ballyhoo, and then when we decide to throw a lure out there, it's got to be an 18 inch lure. It doesn't make any sense. Okay. The fish is still eating that, the, the fish is still eating that, that, that little, that little thing there. Uh, this lure has probably been one of our most successful for tuna fishing uh, when we're using artificials uh, and uh, behind a flippy floppy. So it's, what, what are these, nine inches, the mini? About 10. Who yeah, knows? Ten, <laughs> yeah. Depends on what the batch of skirts comes in at. It's pretty various. And Bill, I'll, I'll give you the credit. I'll give you the credit that you were the guy who was the first one to basically um, realize how good the Brad J was. And it only took yeah. another five years for the Australians to cotton on, and now it's probably the most popular lure here. It only took five years for them to listen. <laughs> and, I, and I told you, um, I, I told you, I just mentioned uh, the Bill Fisher. Yeah. It was uh, Captain Duffy, John Duffy, who who was. He said he said he used to have, he used to have an orange lure that was really really good, and when you would have that rat. And we would go into a turn after we fed the first fish, and that rat would go skipping across the back of the boat. A sailfish could not leave that thing alone. That was actually the Kajiki that you brought back. Uh, you brought back just for yep, those guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And and from there we evolved to I had a bunch of Brad J's and I ran out of Kajikis and they went nuts over the Brad J. Yeah. It was a great, great color. Yeah. Um so as popular as this is, especially for blue marlin and for tuna fish, uh, and, and as popular as it was for white marlin, we started getting uh, complaints. And the complaint was, we can't see those little damn sailfish or those little damn white marlin behind this entire big mess. Yeah. Okay. So the fish is beating us to the teaser or the fish is beating us to the bait and we're having a hard time getting them to switch off once they get all crazy. Right? So, so we, we decided to make the, um, if you can see it here, uh, the Billfish Edition. Yeah. The Billfish Edition has two flippy floppies in the front. And then in order to be able to see what's going on behind there, it's a little daisy chain of three squids, all right? This is our Lumo. So it's a little daisy chain of three of these nine inch Lumos behind two flippy floppies. You still got the, it's like a mullet, you know, party in the front or a business in the front party in the back, you know? <laughs> it was, it was, it was, it was uh, the guys that were really into billfish and liked the, the action of the, the flippy floppy, but didn't like the fact that they couldn't see what was going on. They were getting beat to the bait. Yeah. Uh, so this, this this has become really the the preferred uh, flippy floppy for uh, for bill fishing for smaller billfish. That agitation that you get out of that big four one, the original one, is absolutely killer for blue marlin. Yeah. Absolutely killer for blue. They blue marlin don't daintily come up and uh, and inspect very often. Uh, I think you were the one that told me the first, the, the most aggressive bite that a blue marlin has is the first one. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> from that, we evolved even further down one more step. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this is strictly a game fish. This is strictly a game fish, like a meat fish type application. Caught some of our biggest yellow fins and big eyes on this. Okay, this is the mini flippy floppy, uh, our game fish flippy floppy. Yeah, the, it just just by looking at the size and the and the quality of the swivel will tell you that we're a little bit ambitious on what this thing can can raise. Yeah. So we use this as a hook bait. Okay, we'll put the Brad J mini the, the Brad J mini sprocket. Um, or a bullet uh, behind this thing, and this thing is absolutely taken over in on the East Coast, uh, you know, from Virginia Beach on up uh, for, for tuna fishing. They absolutely love these things. Um, they do very, very well. So, again, the same progression that we're getting on. You know, we went from big dredges to more popular smaller dredges now. Yeah. We've gone to bigger stuff to more popular, you know, I wouldn't, you know, if if I'm if I'm in a billfish tournament worth a million bucks, okay, I want to catch a big ass fish. Um, I'm going to use what I've raised the biggest fish for. Yeah. But day in day out, you can put this on a. What do you get? What is it a? What's 16 kg? Like 30 pound test? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can you can run this off a 30 pound test with a hook on it. Yeah. Okay. I know you guys like light line stuff. Okay, we do too. Um, perfect. The problem, Absolutely. the problem is in tournaments that's banned in Australia. We can't use those. Can't use flippy floppies. They are not. I, you can't, flippy you floppies can't, are not. I, no, you can't use anything in front of in a tournament. You can't use anything in front of the lures, and that's because a young bloke was using a boon bird with a bunch of squid up behind it with a hook lure. Caught too many fish in a tournament, so they thought it was unfair, so they banned it. I'm still trying to get that reversed. But anyway, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> but yeah, it's I incredibly IGFA, effective. I love the IGFA here in the United States, and I respect them. I don't understand the ruling that they had that uh, a bird with a green machine behind it was legal, but a flippy floppy wasn't. Um, forever I'll be confused about that. But that well, in Australia, different. birds are banned uh, outright. Huh? Birds are banned in Australia outright in tournaments. 
Um, I, I have noticed that uh, a lot of the tournaments have been um, have been you know IGFA is a is a, a, a rule a, a, a governing board of uh, suggested rules for for tournament fishing. Yeah. Um, tournaments don't have to abide by it. So I've seen uh, exceptions in tournaments and very very large tournaments. Uh, for uh, Flippy Floppies, by name Flippy Floppies, which made me feel really, really good just that they were talking about it, uh, and uh, spreader bars, uh, stuff like that. Well, uh, if that was legal, I'd be having that on every rod if I was fishing for a big fish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So those are the teasers that we I, I tend to like, and, and I've been seeing that guys uh, – use uh the, the billfish the the, the 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 original one and then something that we sell a ton of is uh singles because everybody has their own way of doing it so a lot of people like to put one a lot of people like to put one every other one you know whatever that whatever floats their boat we sell a ton of singles now yeah. so they can rig it their own way um but there's no doubt in my mind that teasers um Help raise, help, help keep that fish in the spread. Uh, help keep a pack of fish interested. You know, if I didn't have a teaser out there and I had a right flat, and a marlin came and ate my right flat, what's the second marlin gonna eat? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we still, we still got those teasers. We want a tournament. We want a tournament in, um, in, in, um, in Guatemala where. Dredges are banned. You're not allowed to use dredges in, in Guatemala. Uh, we had we had a mouse. We had a, a, a frigate mouse on the right teaser, and it was the most incredible thing I've ever seen. And Amanda hooked the fish, and she's sitting there feeding her fish, and she looks at me and she goes, "There's another fish on that teaser." So I snuck in behind her. I hooked the fish. Amanda moved to the left. I'm feeding the fish. I look at Ken and I said, there's another fish on that teaser. Yeah. Ken came in behind me. He fed the fish. He looked at it and he goes, you're not going to believe this. There's another fish on that teaser. Yeah. The last guy came in. We hooked a quad off of one frigate mouse. Yeah. Okay. Teasers keep the fish in the spread. Oh, 100%. 100, 100%. I mean, even, you know, lure trolling with everything hooked, you know, I, I, I'm sort of, Guys will hook a fish and then they'll pretty much stop the boat to get the gear. And I go, what are you doing? Just keep going. There's, there's not one fish in that spread. There's more. Just keep going. And it, 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 it really frustrates me. I sort of find it hard to put up with when people, you know, the only thing better than catching one fish is catching two. The only thing better than that is catching three. You know, and even solo, we used to hook five at a time. You know, it was, it's good fun. It's what it's all about. You know, you may not be able to catch yeah, them, but right. so what? The sight of seeing five fish jumping behind the boat at the same time is pretty hard to beat. <laughs> pretty hard to beat. J Jimmy Fields Jimmy Fields told me that the first fish in the spread is an indicator that there's fish. Yeah, 100%. Okay. 100%. Keep fishing. Yeah. When you're in a fishy spot, why the hell are you going to stop fishing when you caught your first, when you hooked your first fish? Yeah, and especially when you're tuna fishing. Like, there is no single tuna out there. You know, just keep that boat going. <laughs> you know, it's incredible. But anyway, that, that, that's the traditions. Okay, in Australia, a lot of, you know, we can't use those flippy floppy. So scenario in Australia, you're in a trailer boat. It's 20 foot long. You've got a flippy floppy out the back. And in Australia now, especially in, in Victoria, in the tuna fishery, they're using a lot of flippy floppies with a hook on the back of it. A lot of them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, getting to smaller boats, lighter tackle, you've got a flippy floppy and you're running hook lures in the spread. Once again, how mm -hmm. close should the lure be around the flippy floppy? The the, the the hook lures around the spread or the hook lures directly behind it? Well, around the flippy floppy. You've got a flippy floppy out there. How close should the lures be next to it or behind it or whatever? Oh, oh we, 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 will, we, will have, we will have a flippy floppy in the teaser position, yeah. which is... What's that like? Third wake, I guess. Uh, considered, uh, I like to keep my flippy floppies a little closer because you get greater action with that trajectory going down from the outrigger. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
So, uh, or if you're if you're if you're towing it off the back of the boat, I like to tow it off of a rod that's pretty much straight up. Yeah. Just to get that trajectory, because it gives it more action. So you could use uh, a tag pole so for that, gotta, couldn't you? You could, you we, could. We like to pack it in. Yeah. We like when we're when we're tuna fishing. Um, We'll have a we'll we'll have anywhere from a ten to a fourteen rod spread, and and uh, two teasers. Yeah. Okay, uh, and we like to pack everything in around uh, either the spreader bars or the flippy floppies. So the the honestly the closest distance that you can get without getting tangled up, with, with you know without having to constantly be worried that you're going to catch the flippy or the or the spreader yeah. bar, yeah. is probably the best spot for us. Okay. And then we do have some things. And the reason is, again, if you have them way back there, it's okay to have one way back there down the middle to pick off that one stray fish. But you're trying to get the whole pack into a frenzy. Yeah. And the best way to do that is to bring them closer to the action. So we like to keep everything kind of concentrated um, inside of that fourth weight. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I think that's that, it for that's the flippies. It. That tends that tends to work for, and and you know everybody gets so excited about watching a billfish behind a boat. Uh, I lose my noodle when you just start seeing explosions behind the boat, and you have fourteen rods, and you know that it's going to hurt somebody. Yeah. Because <laughs> when you start seeing fourteen explosions behind the boat and teasers getting absolutely mauled, uh, that, that's exciting fishing. That's yeah. very exciting fishing. Absolutely. <clears throat> Okay, thanks, Bill. So, I guess that's it for the flippies. And next is yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, what do you reckon, yeah. spreader bars? Spreader bars. All right, so this is our this is our latest spreader bar that we're using. This is a standard thirty six inch spreader bar, uh, and we have uh, three birds. And the reason why we like to put birds in the front position on the two outside and, and down the middle is more so to alleviate walking. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if, you, if you just have a squid here, it's very, very light. It doesn't grab. And you know what, you know, you know what I mean by walking, right? When the bar just starts going like this. Yeah. Uh, you see a lot less of that when you stabilize the bar with some birds. Um, the, this is uh, a nine inch pink floaty squid. Uh, the great thing about these things, they've gotten very, very popular. Uh, we, we introduced them about the middle of last year. The foam is shot into the squid. Yeah. So this is not a cigar minnow. So the original way we used to uh, load up our bars was we take a, a, a simple cigar minnow, pull the peg, and we would force that, we would soak it up and force that in the squid. And then you would have this thing, the squid would dislodge from the, the, the you'd, have, you'd have everything flying all over the place outside of each other and yeah. it would pull off. And it just wouldn't, it just, it's, it's just cumbersome. <laughs> This gets shot into the squid. So the entire cavity from here to here is completely full, full without any void except for the, the, the dowel that was in there to, to make the line hole. Yeah. Uh, so what this does is a couple of things. It makes it a little bit more erratic and it allows it to float. We were going to call this the drifter bite bar. Yeah. Okay. But it would have been a lot of explanation, but it's a floaty squid because the entire thing is buoyant. And when you have 11 of these things buoyant, the whole thing, it'll, it'll suspend the whole bar. Yeah. Okay. So this is so cool. When you're tuna fishing and let's say your bar didn't get bit. Let's say one of your, your ballyhoos with a, with, with a little, or one of your lures, uh, your mini sprockets out there, or your ballyhoo with the sea witch out there got hit, uh, and you and you trolled around a little bit trying to get more bites, and you only got one or two bites, and you got two fish on. Okay. Yeah. 
Like you said, what's what's the natural thing that they do? Stop. They bring the whole mess in and they fight the two fish. Yeah. Okay. Well, you kind of have to bring a spreader bar in because the spreader bar sinks, and then you have to sit there and you have to maneuver the boat and the rods and all to get away from this thing to not catch this thing while you're fighting your tuna. Yeah. This floaty bar floats. So you just sit there and you twitch it a little bit. And the action of 11 squids just floating at a kill scene that has two tuna fish on a hook, the fish can't stand it. Yeah. The drifter bite, the drifter bites that we have gotten off of this floaty bar have been absolutely epic to watch them explode on a bar that's just kind of wallowing in the current as you're fighting the other two fish. And you can see the bar the entire time, so you can maneuver around it without fear of hooking it. Absolutely. So that's one of the reasons why this thing has gotten very, very popular. 36-inch um, bar, that's the standard size that everybody uses here uh, where, where we tuna fish. Some guys like uh, some guys like a bigger bar. Um, a lot of guys like uh, like a 30-inch bar or a 24-inch 20, a bar. Uh you can't get too small in the bar because if you get too small in the bar, you'll get walking. Yeah. Uh, and it's uncontrollable. So um, we use we use 36, we use 29, and that's about it. That, yeah. That's 24, 29. Um, they, they tend to work. We use the A-frame again to try and to try and uh, to try and uh, curtail the walking uh, and try and keep this thing. Uh, moving uh, in a straight position. I I personally like three bars. Um, the boat we fish on usually fishes two bars because they like to pack them in with Bally who's all around it. Um, yeah. But I like I like one bar or a flippy floppy or that or that mini flippy floppy down the middle with it to the back. And that's pretty much the way we tuna fish with, with these bars. Do you use them um, for sailfish and marlin as well? Do you use the bars for sailfish and marlin as well? It has gotten absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely um, popular and uh, gaining in popularity. Um, it's funny because a lot of guys don't like to use bars because they're a pain in the ass to, to haul in to get away from a sailfish, to get away from a hot sailfish, and God forbid a blue marlin gets behind it, uh, they could wreak havoc with this thing. Yeah. Um, but then you see the boats that are winning tournaments, and damned if they don't have a pink spreader bar on their right side uh, yeah. as a teaser. Uh, you are seeing it more and more and more across every ocean, not just uh, in the Mid-Atlantic where it started. Uh, I see it in the Pacific all over the place. I see it in the, especially, uh, I see it in the Pacific in, in, um, in uh, El Salvador, in um, Costa Rica, uh, just about every place we go now. We see a lot of these being used for bullfish teasers. Fantastic. Yeah. And, um, and, and, the cool one of, one of the greatest things I, I know I keep going back to this, but any type of a <coughs> any type of a jetted lure, um, I like these because uh, they're light and it's easier to pull away because these are light and you, you got a, a lighter thing. But any type of a jetted lure uh, with no meat stuck in it, uh, and then if your captain is absolutely adamant, like so many captains are. Uh, that they must have a ballyhoo or a, or a bonita strip or a dolphin belly, mahi belly, uh, then you don't want a jetted lure for that application uh, in a teaser because the jet will help wash it out a little bit faster. Yeah. yeah. Oh, did you know that those but are actually... We've not, but we've been, we've been using, but we've been using these and, and, and uh, the Lumo sprocket, medium sprocket, and the rat, um, frigate, the mouse frigate, uh, we've been using them without uh, any bait, and we've been getting tremendous success. Yeah. Did you know that the fish prints are actually floaty lures too? They keep getting hit, so you never realise it, but they actually float as well, so you can have them alongside those floaty bars, and away you go. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, good stuff. Well, thanks, Bill, for that. Thanks for letting us know about the spreader bars.
and well, well, that yeah. is talk about the fact that you've got an incredibly successful business with uh, your products. You've, you've grown immensely, bought other companies and all sorts of stuff, and your booms and all sorts of stuff. So you've been doing unbelievably well, and you've sold a hell of a lot of Pakula lures ever since you became our distributor. But I think the most important thing to our customers is, okay, who, Filipino, he's got a good business. Of course, he's promoting dredges and his products. What they probably don't know is that over the last time since you became our distributor, the amount of tournament winning boats that you get on and these multi-million dollar, multi-huge boat tournaments like Bisbee's and El Salvador and all these other places where you're pretty much on the podium every single tournament you get into and I've been keeping track of your winnings, wondering when you're going to have enough money to buy Pakula Lewis and I can retire. And I figure in the last three or four years, you've actually been on boats winning a total prize money of about $6 million, at least $4 million. You want, you want to run we through never, some of those uh, stories? Yeah, we never, I never really did that. I know you asked me to do that, but we never really um, listed them. But uh, I've just been fortunate. I, I've been fortunate to... to to get on boats uh, that all all the boats aside from very very small intricate details, um, we all fish, and this goes back to what you were talking about earlier. We all fish the same way, okay? We all fish the same way. Four naked ballyhoos, maybe a blue marlin lure, probably a hookless blue marlin lure, uh, two dredges, two teasers, light line, uh, no drag and keep that damn boat moving every time you hook up. Um, and the guys that we fish with are just so damn good. They're so, they're so in tune the entire time. I remember when I first started uh, tournament fishing, um, you know, what was in the cooler was equally as important as to what was in the, uh, what baits we were using, okay? We had to make sure there was three cases of beer next to next to the valley uh that's that's for, for the most part in the winter circle that's gone you got guys holding the rods for eight hours uh having a good time but intently paying attention to the spread i remember when the captain was the only one that paid attention to the spread and sometimes the mate yeah um now you got four eyes as, as anglers uh, or five or six as anglers, you got two or three unbelievable mates with eyes that are just ridiculous. Uh, you got a captain that's got his head buried in the sonar uh, and, and trying to look in, in back at the baits. Um, the element of surprise, whether it's a good thing or, or not, has kind of gotten away from that billfish that pops up behind the boat. Because so many people have such good eyes, and so many people are such good anglers nowadays that uh, it, it it it's almost like it's expected, you know. And, yeah. And I think when when you know that fish is going to be back behind the boat, either because of the sonar or because the tower guy saw it, or because one of the anglers saw it, um, your odds increase exponentially that you're going to hook that fish. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and all the boats that I've gotten to be a part of, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the King, the King two, uh, most recently in the Unimas, uh, uh, the, the, the Tranquilo, which I spent six years on and, and we just had an unbelievable run and, and the blood money, which my nephew runs, uh, and it's our team on the East coast, uh, was just had a phenomenal year, pretty much placing second in every damn tournament we got into. Yeah. Um, there's a seriousness about, there's a serious fun about it and it's, um, and, and, and we're all pretty much on the same page. Uh, there's, there's, there's no, there's no longer any, any arguing about what we should do. Uh, yeah. and, and the one thing that I noticed about these teams, uh, especially the blood money, since it's my home, my home team that we, where I live, um, the amount of practice time that we get together as a team really helped us become, uh, you know, tr trust, 
you don't, nobody wants to miss a flat line bite. Okay. Yeah. But I damn know, I damn well know that if I miss that flat line bite, that fish is going to get picked up by my long rear guy. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's become, it's become a true team sport now, uh, that, that, you know, if your goal is to win top angler, uh, there's a pretty damn good chance that you're not going to win the tournament. Yeah. If your goal is to win the tournament, then there's a pretty good damn chance that you're not going to have a top angler on your boat because those bites are going to get spread out, you know? Exactly. Uh, everybody, everybody's equally as uh, proficient um, as the next guy. So that, that's, and you got to have the vibe, you know, you got to have that good vibe. Uh, Anthony says it, Ken said it, you know, Victor said it, uh, the, 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 you got to have that vibe of you just want to fish with these guys. Yeah. And, uh, it really, it really, um, I guess you leave that superstar status, you know, to the guy that wants to get top angler. Yeah. Now, if it's an angler tournament, that's great. But, um, but you know, we're in it, we're in it for the win. The, the big check comes in the win of, of, uh, you know, the team. Absolutely. Oh, well, good luck to you, Bill. And, and thanks for all that. And, uh, I certainly appreciate your time. Have, I will tell you. I will tell you a story about the Bisbees. Um, we were um, we 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 were on the Tranquilo and we fished uh, all three of the Bisbees. There's 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 a there's a Los Cabos, which is the Marlin Magazine tournament. I think it is that they call it the Bonnier tournament. That's two days, and then there's the little Bisbees, and then there's the big Bisbees, and all three of them pretty much run back to back to back. Okay, and uh, we were in. Ken asked me if uh, I would come fish the uh, the Bisbees with him, and he had won the Bisbees two years prior. Uh, he had won a uh, two point nine million between the big Bisbees and the little Bisbees. He won both of them. Uh, then they took a year off or something, and then um, he asked me if I would come. I had heard about Mag Bay. Yeah, I wanted to go to Mag Bay. I didn't want to fish the Bisbees. Hey, it's a huge money tournament, and I'm 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 not that much of a gambler. And and B, my goal is to go catch you know a bunch of uh, of uh, striped marlin. Anyway, he said, I promise you, we'll go to Mag Bay the day after the Bisbees. Yeah, but you got to fish the Bisbees with us. So I, I went. Uh, I fished the Bisbees with them. We didn't do crap in the first tournament. We did less than crap in the second tournament. In the first two days of the Bisbees, uh, we caught a few fish, uh, but we just did not do much. Uh, did not do much with it. Um, I was inside making a sandwich. It was my turn to be in the chair. Uh, the fish hit the right long, and Amanda immediately picked up the left flat. Now she picked up a one thirty. <laughs> She picked up a 130, and I didn't know what she was doing. And she said, "I got one on." Right. Okay. We had a mouse out there on the on, on the left flat, and she said, "A frigate mouse." And she goes, "I got one on," and I'm like, "They yelled at me to come in, come in, out from inside and get in the chair." I got in the chair, and when we saw my fish jump, everybody got quiet. Yeah. We knew we had a winning fish on from the very, very first jump. But Amanda still had her fish on that weighed about 120 pounds. <laughs> I think one or two or three or nine of us suggested that she cut the fish off. And she said, well, what if I have the big fish on? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, she didn't. But she's such a damn good angler that um, uh, she stand up with a 130 uh caught that blue in about three minutes and luckily it didn't interfere with mine. Oh man, we, women, women, women and fishing, even my wife Jo has done the most insane things. If you'd have told me that a little five foot three blonde, as skinny as a rake, can do what she did with granders and 130s, she caught her first grander in less than, I think, five minutes. And, <laughs> and you know, everybody's looking at everybody's panicking. Oh, nobody told her a thing. She was screwing it up. And uh, <laughs> she had the rod sideways. The line was cutting her wrist. She still got the scars, and the fish just swam to the boat. I think they just like women. They look up and go, "Yeah, she's pretty." <laughs> I'm coming yeah. for a look. 
Unbelievable. So we had the we had the, we had my fish on for <coughs> forty two minutes. We had my fish on for forty two minutes, and um, and I'll never forget this because we have it on video. And the last six minutes, seven minutes, there was not a word uttered. Yeah. Uh, that's the confidence you have in your team, right? It was, we had Victor and Daniel as our mates, um, and 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 I was on the rod, and and it it was just per, it was perfect. There was nothing said, um, and uh, we got the fish. It ended up being a five seventy seven, and on the last day of the tournament, we won one point four million and won the Bisbees. Um, Wait. Which was pretty cool because I wanted to go there to go to Mac Bay. I had no interest in the business, and it turned out, you know, went in, went in the Super Bowl. And did so, you? And did you go to Mac Bay? We went to Mac Bay. Uh, we went to Mac Bay the day after the awards ceremony, and um, I'm not going to lie to you. There was some. There was. I don't drink, but there was a lot of headaches on the boat from the guys that do. Oh, I bet. <laughs> Okay. They were hoping. They were hoping that we would take one more day off before <laughs> we went to Mag Bay. The first day we caught seventy five. The next day we caught one hundred and two, and the third day we caught fifty six before we decided to come home. Wow! Oh, good on you, Bill. Yeah. Well, thank you. That was a good week. Thank you very much for your time, and I think the information you, you've given, I've learned a lot. I guess I've got to order a lot more of those other products you mentioned, floaty stuff and little stuff, which I guess you did intentionally because you're the ultimate. Fisherman, and you catch me every time. So thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Take care, guys. I think that was excellent, Bill. Good. Good. Let's just hope it recorded properly, which I'll know <laughs> eventually.